residential entrance. Um, and so that means that average cost pricing can be a useful benchmark even when it's not literally uh, possible to contest the industry. If there's a number of potential entrants, if entry is quite easy and easy to reverse if it's unsuccessful, um, and I think that you know there's important economic factors that make this easier or harder. So one answer you could have given to the second uh, short answer question about the cloud computing is the cloud has made it a lot easier to enter industries quickly and then to exit them, right? Because you're able now, rather than building up a giant server farm yourself, to actually um, just rent facilities for uh, a short period of time, right? Basically just have some space on the servers and then if you're not successful, you can stop paying for it, right? Um, also, the more committed the incumbent is to his price, the harder it is for him to reduce the price if you enter, the more uh, attractive it will be for someone to enter. Okay, so why isn't average cost pricing efficient? Well, average cost and marginal cost are just not the same thing, right? And the social optimum is when price equals marginal cost, not average cost, right? Um, when pricing, <coughs> when marginal cost pricing leads to losses, that's because marginal cost pricing is below average cost pricing, right? And thus, average cost pricing leads to hot, too high of a price, too low of a quantity, right? Um, this is really not that dissimilar to monopoly pricing. It's just a little bit less extreme, right? Because a monopolist is always going to try to make positive profits, right? Not just try to price equal to average cost. And thus, they'll always charge a price that's above the average cost, and that will lead to even lower quantities than average cost pricing, right? And in fact, I want to show a very, very close relationship between these. So what is the distortion that's caused by average cost pricing? Well, we'd like prices to be marginal cost, but they're above marginal cost by the difference between average and marginal cost, right? That's the distortion caused by uh, uh, average cost pricing. And there's just a Harberger triangle there. What is the size of that distortion? Well, remember that the difference between average and marginal cost is the negative of the slope of average cost times quantity. Right? Why is that? Well, remember the story about my, my wife, right? When she was the marginal person, if she was the average cost was gonna the average score was gonna rise when she, the marginal person, was above the average score. Right? So similarly, the difference between average and marginal cost is equal to the slope of the average cost curve. Um, and notice that this is really extremely similar to the monopoly distortion, right? Because average price is average revenue, right? And so it was the slope of average revenue times the quantity that was the Cournot distortion. Here it's the slope of the average cost times the quantity, which is the uh, distortion from average cost pricing. Right? And this is proportional, just like in the monopoly case, to the size of the market and to the slope of the average cost curve. That is, to the degree of economies or diseconomies of scale. And what this tells us is that even in the natural monopoly case, where there's actually uh, marginal cost above average cost, we can still have a distortion from average cost pricing. And that actually comes from the prices being too low. So in this case, a regulator might come in and do average cost pricing, drive the firm down to this point, that would actually mean that the prices were too low and that there was too much produced. Okay, so let me give you a, a picture of the classic case when marginal cost is declining, we have economies of scale all the way through. So then average cost is above the marginal cost curve, right? And um, the equilibrium is where the demand is equal to average cost, whereas the social optimum is the place where demand equals to marginal cost, and the distortion is this Harberger triangle in between them. Okay. okay. So, um, at least as important of a distortion caused by our... So the, the 
Static distortion caused by prices being too high or too low is an important one, but at least as important of an effect of average cost regulation is its effect on the longer term incentives. So, and the, the reason is that companies can easily affect their costs. They can do things like go out and spend a lot of money on, you know, uh, wine, women, and song, as I was giving in the example from Margin Call. But they could also just fail to make a lot of effort to cut costs or cut workers or something like that. Um, they could not innovate, right? Uh, they can choose more or less expensive ways to produce. And unless these are controlled and monitored by a regulator, the firm's not going to have any incentive to reduce its cost under average cost pricing. Because every time it reduces its cost, it gets less payment from the government, right? It gets, it, its price has to go down exactly to compensate for that reduced cost, right? And that gives it no incentive to reduce its cost. And this is what you're going to explore on, on this week's problem set, which is due on Tuesday. Um, so, uh, in fact, a particularly perverse example of this is when you have a regulator who's actually learning about what your costs are. He, figured, he decides what he thinks your costs are likely to be tomorrow based on what your costs are today. And that gives you a huge incentive to inflate your costs today so that you'll have a bigger budget tomorrow. Right? You'll get paid more tomorrow. So a classic example of this is government agencies, which have budgets each year. And their budgets are often determined by what their budget was last year. So if a government agency ends up saving money this year, that totally messes them up next year because they don't get allocated as much, because they, they decide, look, they can survive on less. So a class, this happened to my father. So my father was working for a defense contractor, and they went and made a proposal to some general in the army. And they were able to do it for half the budget, right? And uh, the guy said to him, I would be failing in my duty to my country if I spent a single cent less than the, was allocated in the budget for this weapons system. Because he knew that if he did, next year their budget would be cut. Yeah, Matt? But isn't that counterbalanced by the fact that if your budget for a program gets too big, it's going to get cut entirely? You know, it's kind of like, well, yeah. that, that, that's possible. Yeah, so th those are those are things that sort of offset each other, and that can help that can help reduce some part of these incentives, as long as the cutting is responsive to like inflation of that sort, and that you don't just cut, leave the big, awful projects, and then cut all the small efficient ones, which sometimes happens. Um, so, uh, other ca uh, causes of average cost pricing have similar problems. So even if it's not regulation that's causing the average cost pricing, still when there's average cost pricing, that can reduce incentives to cut costs. So for example, if a firm can innovate or do something else to reduce its costs, and other firms can immediately imitate them, then they have almost no incentive to do that. right? Um, and so this is going to be the topic of Tuesday's lecture. Okay. So one important source uh, of the fact that cost curves aren't just flat, so that they go up or down, which causes this uh, average versus marginal cost problem, is uh, selection. Um, and we talked about this in lecture three, but I want to review it again. So the idea here is that there's some policy, maybe it's insurance, maybe it's a loan that's given out, maybe it's assets that are sold, and there's some fraction of the population that participates in the transaction at a prevailing price P. But costs are not linear because different people are more or less costly to, to uh, cover with the insurance or to provide a loan to because some people are more or less likely to pay the loan back, etc. So um, if the riskiest people are the ones who are willing to pay the most to get the contract, if they're the first ones into the market, then we say that selection is adverse. That might help happen in health insurance because the people who most want to get uh, covered are the people who are likely to be the sickest. And uh, Mariana, um, what would the slope of the cost curve look like in the case of adverse selection? Um, well, since you were having the riskiest people go first, who would be willing to pay the most, it would slope down. Yeah, exactly. So you'd have a downward sloping 
uh, cost curve. Um, and uh, on the other hand, we would say that there's advantageous selection if the safest people are in first. So examples of that might be, you think in the subprime housing boom, a lot of people thought the problem was that loans got so cheap that they started making them to lots of people who couldn't afford them, right? And that would be a case of uh, advantageous selection. The people who were willing to pay the most were the people who uh, had too high, um, who, who were, the people who were willing to pay the most were the safest people. People who were willing to pay less were less safe, right? Um, another example of that could be in insurance. Imagine that some people sort of know about all the risks to their health. The people who really know about the risks to their health are probably also going to be the people who are going to get a lot of insurance, but they're also going to be the people who are going to take better care of their health, right? And so in that case, you might have advantageous selection. The people who are willing to pay the most for health care are actually the people who are the least risky. And in what direction would the cost curves slope in that case? Coal? Is coal here? No. Well, it, basically, obviously, it's the opposite, right? The, the cost curves slope upwards, right? Um, so this sort of situation could arise in insurance when, like, the poor, uneducated people choose not to give insurance. And, of course, a mixture is possible. It doesn't always slope down or up. It could go up and down and, and so forth. So there could be adverse selection over some regions, advantageous over others. Um, notice that this is the cost curve not of an individual insurer, an individual loan maker, but of the industry as a whole. But a, month, but a lot of these things like insurance and credit are things that we think about for the country as a whole. And so it's not, you know, we can think of the whole country as having a cost curve like this. Now, um, unless an insurer is able to discriminate and charge different prices to different people based on their health conditions, the insurer is basically, if he's going to offer to sell insurance, going to get a pretty representative sample of the whole population of people, right, who will sign up for insurance with them. And under these cases, the cost to him of insuring more people is exactly the average cost, right? If he attracts one more person, he just has to pay the average cost of insuring that person. And so equilibrium with free entry, and this gets back to Matt's question, in this type of a market is exactly going to be average cost pricing, right? So that's a case where competition leads us to average cost pricing, uh, even though it's not, you know, a, there's not sort of any monopoly type thing. Um, and that average cost pricing may well be inefficient for the same reason it is in the regulation uh, type context that we were talking about. Anything you can say about the regulation of a natural monopoly, you can say about these selection markets, uh, basically. So when selection is advantageous, we might get too much insurance. Or in the case of the housing market, I think a lot of people think that there was too much lending to people who couldn't afford to repay the loans because everyone was trying to get the few people who could afford to repay the loans. They were all charging the average cost or the giving people the price relative to the average repayment, rather than charging them based on the fact that those people were very unlikely to repay. Um, on the other hand, when selection is adverse, there's too little insurance. Um, these people are afraid to wind up with all the people who are very sick. And a very extreme case of this is what's called a death spiral, which is that basically, you know, at, here, the, imagine the market price for insurance is currently $100. The average person who's willing to buy it at $100 uh, costs $200 to insure. Well, so then you raise the price to $200. Oh, but then the average person who's willing to pay that much uh, actually is um, 500, costs $500 to insure them. So you raise the price to $500. Well, but then only the really sick people are willing to take the insurance, right? So you have to raise the price to $1,000, and it just keeps going higher and higher. That's what happened in uh, your last problem set in, the, in part, part two at, at, towards the end, was that you know, if you make people pay to uh, you know, set up their stand in the street, a uh, certain amount of money, only the people in the really busy parts of town will set up under that amount. So you're gonna then, that causes a big externality, so you raise it. But then it's only people in the even busier parts of the town. And, and 